Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Tara and I am here to talk about Linux virtualization based security and some of the kernel integrity features that we have enabled via LBBS. Uh, so I, I work at Microsoft and my team and I have been working on this for last year, year and a half, year and a half, two years now. Uh, so quick look at the agenda. So if I know some of you have attended LSS. Uh, North America earlier this year, and we did have a very similar presentation there as well. So the initial few slides, which introduces what is LVBS and the basic architecture is probably similar. And then we get into kernel integrity, particularly memory protections and module loading, and that is probably different this time. And I do have a demo, and then we conclude the presentation. So to start with, uh, I want to touch upon the motivation behind this project. The motivation here is that Linux kernel itself being complex is a highly lucrative target for attackers, and we do increasingly hear about privilege escalation attacks in the kernel. And the goal here with LVBS is to harden the kernel against such attacks and to ensure that in event of such attacks, the existing protections that have been placed on the kernel cannot be turned off by the malicious attacker. And also that certain critical resources in the kernel, like keys, um, memory, registers, etc., remain protected in event of an attack. With that, what is LVBS? LVBS is Linux virtualization-based security. It is inspired from Windows VBS, and it uses hypervisor and hardware, hardware virtualization support to protect the guest OS. But unlike Windows VBS, here we do target and we want to have an open source architecture. By that, what I mean is that, of course, we want the code to be upstream and we do have a GitHub repo with all the code that we have developed so far and all that. Uh, but we also want this architecture itself to be hardware agnostic. So we do have this working on AMD and Intel x64 processors today. Uh, we can enable this for ARM64, though we are not working on it at this point. More importantly, we want this to be hypervisor agnostic. So we have this again working on Hyper-V and KVM. Though this presentation itself will focus on Hyper-V. So a quick look at a Hyper-V based system and Hyper-V's virtual secure mode. So in the picture here, you have, there's hardware and there's Hyper-V on top of it. And then Hyper-V divides the system into multiple partitions. One root partition or host partition and multiple guest partitions. And through VSM, what Hyper-V does is it allows for each partition to be further subdivided into separate execution environments. And these environments are known as virtual trust levels or VTLs. Theoretically, Hyper-V allows for 16 VTLs, but for purpose of this talk and for any practical purpose, we only talk about two VTLs, VTL 0 and VTL 1. And the other property that is established through VSM is that Higher VTLs have more privilege over lower, lower VTLs, which means in this case, VTL 1 is a more privileged execution environment than VTL 0. And some of the other VSM features include a virtual processor state isolation. So virtual processors, they maintain a separate per VTL state, and each VTL can de define its own set of private uh, processor registers. Uh, it allows for memory access and hierarchy protection through uh, extended page table or second level page tables. And each VTL does maintain its own set of page tables or guest page tables, the first level page tables. And further, a higher VTL, like in this case a VTL1, can impose memory restrictions on lower VTLs, VTL0, which the lower VTL cannot turn off. Finally, each VTL has its own interrupt subsystem, and each VTL has its own interrupt and intercept handling capability. This allows for every VTL to process its interrupt without interference from a lower VTL. And here is the link if you want to know more about Hyper-V and VSM. So let's relook at the goals, right? So through LVBS, again, what we want to do is to ensure that in event of a kernel attacker, we ensure kernel integrity. By that, what I mean is we ensure that kernel memory and critical registers are protected. And two is in event of a kernel attack, in the event of a kernel attack, we want to protect critical system resources like passwords and secrets, et cetera. And this talk primarily focuses on kernel integrity, not the second goal. So with that, 
Here is the threat model for kernel integrity. Here, the sec what our security goal here is to protect kernel from a user space attacker uh, who has established privilege escalation by exploiting a kernel vulnerability. And with the, in the trusted in, in this case within the TCB or trusted computing base, Hyper-V and the if applicable the host OS does fall within the TCB. What is outside of the TCB is the guest OS user space and the guest OS kernel itself after a certain level of boot. And finally, I want to say that Linux kernel itself establishes all these protections. Kernel is self-protected. And what we aim to do via LVBS is defense in depth. By, what, by that, what I mean is the protections that the kernel enforce, we want to move it up or down a level depending on your view of where hypervisor sits in the virtualization stack. Through which we want to ensure that even if the kernel gets compromised, these protections cannot be turned off or altered with. So that brings us to, this is the high level software architecture uh, of LVBS. So again, there is bare metal, Hyper-V runs on top of hardware, and then Hyper-V, this is a view of a guest partition that Hyper-V has established. So the partition is divided into two, VTL0 and VTL1, and we have a secure OS now running in VTL1. In, in our case, for LVBS, we do have the secure OS, it's a minimal Linux kernel. Why minimal Linux kernel is a discussion for another day. It's a full talk on itself, so I will not get into that here. But what, what runs today is minimal Linux kernel. And all those pink boxes that you see in secure Linux kernel are the bits and pieces that we have enabled or we have written code for to ensure that the secure kernel can take in requests from the guest kernel uh, can take in requests from the guest kernel and then uh, enforce those requests or enforce those protections via Hyper-V. And also um, to make sure that it has the capability to handle exceptions in case of a memory, in case of a protection violation. And finally, the interesting piece on the Linux, guest Linux kernel are the green boxes, which is the hypervisor agnostic layer. It is what we call it hypervisor enforced kernel integrity layer. And we have submitted RFC patches in the mailing list. We have submitted two RFC patches so far. And so work is in progress to get it upstreamed. And this is the agnostic layer. So this remains the same irrespective of the hypervisor underneath. Whether we replace, if we replace Hyper-V with KVM, this piece or these green boxes remain the same. What will change is the, again the pink boxes in the Linux kernel. In our case, this is a Hyper-V VSM driver. And this driver, one, allows for the secure OS to be booted in, the, in VTL1. And two, it collects all the protection requests from HECI or the hypervisor agnostic layer and passes it on to the secure OS. Okay, so very quick look at the boot sequence here because this is probably, yeah, a very quick look at the boot sequence. So one of the basic assumption we have is that we need secure boot enabled. This is a security solution, so LVBS needs secure boot enabled, which again means that if secure boot is enabled, we assume that the guest kernel can be trusted till the first, till the point where the first user process starts running, which is the init process in case of Linux, because the guest kernel itself is verified by secure boot. And so till that point, we assume that the kernel probably is vulnerable, but it's not compromised yet. And after the first init process starts running, we assume that the kernel can be compromised. With this assumption, how the boot sequence for LVBS today looks is that guest kernel starts to boot, it does its setup, initialization setup, and then it loads the VSM Hyper-V specific VSM driver, which goes ahead and verifies the secure OS binaries, which is part of initRD. And it loads it into a previously established memory space uh, boots the CPUs in this, uh, boots the CPU in the secure OS, uh, apply, collects all the protections from the hypervisor agnostic layer, sends it, sends it to the secure OS, um, and the secure OS applies these protections, and finally, and th there ends the boot process, and finally the uh, guest kernel asks the secure OS to actually lock down these protections, and there the boot sequence ends. So 
talking about VTL0, VTL1 interfaces, there are two kinds of interfaces. One is a synchronous interface, in which case a virtual processor enters VTL1 when it really, when it wants to enter VTL1. So it, it explicitly makes a hyper call. It is called a VTL call or a VMM call to enter VTL1. And in this, and in this case, we have established a bunch of opcodes which for these VTL calls. And we allow for only these opcodes. So if the guest OS issues a VTL call with the opcode that we have not defined, secure OS returns an error back. And so these are the only opcodes that a VTL call supports today. And the second means of the second interface is an asynchronous interface. And there are two interfaces here. One is secure interrupt interface. Uh, in this case, a virtual processor will enter a, v enter a higher VTL, in this case VTL1, if it receives an interrupt in VTL1. And the Hyper-V ensures that the VP is switched to VTL1 in this case. And the second asynchronous interface is a secure intercept interface, where if VTL0 violates VTL1 protection, the VP that triggered that protection violation is switched by the Hyper-V over to VTL1. These are the two asynchronous interfaces between VTL0 and VTL1. So with all this, let us start looking at memory protections itself. So like I said, kernel integrity here is two pieces, register protection and memory protection. We talk more on memory protection and then module loading in this talk. Um, I do have slides on register protection. I mean, can, we can get to it if, in the end if we have time. Okay, so for, for memory protection, what happens is guest kernel boots. Um, it loads the secure OS, and after that, the hypervisor agnostic layer, the HECI layer, comes in, and it allocates and it collects permission for every guest kernel page in the, uh, every physical page in the guest kernel, and then issue, and then the guest kernel issues a VTL call, which is the protect memory VTL call, with all these memory ranges and permissions to secure kernel. Secure kernel, once it receives the protect memory VTL call, calls into Hyper-V, it's a hyper call, and uh, to set these permissions in the extended page tables or second level page tables. And then the control returns back. So this is a single call, just at the end of boot sequence before the first process is called first user space process is called. It's an immutable call. Once these permissions are established, uh, VTL0 can no longer go and explicitly change these permissions in the EPT. And secondly, we do issue a lockdown VTL call from VTL0 to VTL1, upon which VTL1 revokes access to most of these VTL calls that establishes the protections. So, it, so that this, info, this ensures that the protections we set are immutable. So with that, now once these permissions have been established, this is how the kernel memory space itself looks like. There is kernel read-only data section, which has read-only permission set in EPT. Text space, which has read and kernel execute permission set. VTL1 memory space, that gets no access from VTL0. VTL0 cannot read, write, or execute from VTL1. And then rest of the kernel memory space, which is read, read, write, and user execute permission. The thing to note here is that by default, without LVBS, the permissions in EPT is read, write, kernel execute, and user execute for all guest pages. Okay, and, in, and once these protections are established, if there is an EPT access violation, uh, memory intercept is in, injected into VTL1, and the secure OS handles this memory intercept by raising a general protection fault in the guest OS. So this is the VTL call that we issue to actually lock down the protections. This happens at the end of establishing all the protections. We establish all the protections, and guest kernel goes ahead and sends this VTL call, which says signal end of boot to VTL1. At that point, VTL1 sets a end of boot flag and comes back. And what happens as a result of setting this flag is that all the VTL calls that are listed in the table here are revoked and any attempt to invoke them will actually return an error back from secure OS. Uh, 
So let's okay, let's relook at kernel memory space again. Okay, uh, in this case, we the, 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 these are the kernel sections. Then there is a permission that is enforced by uh, through LVBS in the EPTs. And then what the last two columns show that show a bunch of features. These are kernel features. This, this is not an attacker or anything. These are actual kernel features that various kernel text patching features that tries that goes ahead and modifies these established permissions. So there is text section which has read kernel execute, and there is all these text patching features: f trace, light patching, jump label optimization, static call optimization, k probes, that actually tries to reset the read execute to read write execute, patch the text and set it back to read execute. The read only data section remains read only. Similarly, data and VSS section remains read write. There is module loading reserved memory, which is set as read write during boot. And during module loading, the module loading code sets some parts of these memory to read or read execute, depending on where it loads the read only data or the module text section. Similarly, there is crash kernel reserved memory, which again is enforced with read-write permission during boot, but KX can come in and change the permission to read-write execute to load and boot a crash kernel. And finally, the rest of the memory space, which is again read-write, but eBPF JIT can change it depending on what we load to read execute, depending on the program we load. So this brings so this brings us to the point where till so we implemented till this point and then uh, and we had the kernel working we had LVBS working but none of these features working okay because kernel is locked down at this point with the hyper with the VTL call that we sent before which said signal end of boot we lock it down and we revoke access to any of these mm, VTL calls and none of these features were working so then we started enabling these features one at a time. And we have module loading working today, and we are working on some of the other features. But the basic principle, design principle behind enabling all these features, tech, any of the text patching features with LVBS is that the secure OS in VTL1 should be able to verify, authenticate the text or the blob independently. Uh, if needed, copy the text or the patch to VTL0 memory, or Verify that what VTL0 has copied is valid and is not being tampered with, and then change the VTL0 me memory permissions to what is needed, all in one atomic operation. VTL0 should not get involved in between these steps when VTL1 does this. So let's look at how we did, uh, with this principle, how we enabled module loading. So one of the first things that VTL, the secure OS running in uh, VTL1 needs for uh, establishing independent module verification are, is a bunch of kernel information from VTL0. This includes the build and boot time certificates, revocation certificates, and kernel symbol table sections. So we did, NA, we did add a VTL call, which is called the load kernel data, through which we can load any of the VTL0 kernel data at boot. And this again happens before the kernel is locked down. And so through that, we load relevant VTL0 kernel data. In, for, in case of module loading, these are the data kernel data that we need. As we add more features, and if we need more kernel data that needs to be sent from VTL0 kernel to VTL1 secure OS, we can do that. And today, secure kernel on receiving this creates a VTL0 trusted keyring and loads the VTL0 build time certificates adds the revocation certificates and hashes to the blacklist keyring, and it copies and maintains it co its copy of VTL0 k So, and that brings to module loading. So, during module loading, what happens is the guest kernel or VTL0 comes in, tries to load the module, allocates independently, it verifies the module depending on, on whether config module, I think SIG is set or not. And then it tries to assemble the module into all the sections. It applies all the relocations and all that. And after that, what we did is we added a VTL call called um, validate module, which passes the initial blob, initial non-modified blob, and all the memory sections that VTL0 has established for the module and some flags. 
What VTL1 does is that it, it, it authenticates the module using the previously established VTL0 trusted keyring, and then it reconstructs the entire module in VTL1 memory space. And it compares the mem all the reconstructed memory sections with the memory sections that VTL0 passed. And if this matches, and only if this matches, does it issue the hyper call to change the permissions in the EPT. And once that happens, it returns back. And when it returns back, it returns a unique token back, and that is needed for the next part of module loading. So one thing that I should mention here is that because this is a Linux kernel, a minimal Linux kernel that runs in VTL1, we could actually reuse a lot of Linux's module loading facilities and functions to independently reconstruct the module in VTL1. We didn't have to actually go ahead and write a lot of that infrastructure. We could just reuse most of it that exists. Okay, so the, okay, the module is loaded, but then once the module in it is called, what happens is that uh, we need to reset the permissions of the init sections because init sections do get deallocated. And also there, are, there could be data that needs to be set as read only after init. And this happens through another VTL call, which is called free module init. And in this case, VTL, and as part of this VTL call, the previous unique token is passed to VTL1. So VTL1 is able to identify which module with, which is the module with that token. And so it goes ahead and applies the relevant permission. So in case of init sections, all it does is it changes the read execute to read write. And in case of read only, it goes and sets, uh, in case of read only after init, it goes and sets the read write to re read only. And then it returns back. So I do have to say that there is still work. We are still, and it works, we are, but we are still working on enabling some of these architecture dependent features with module loading. And they are red pullings and some of the C, CFI features and return tongues and things like that. With that, I do actually have a demo that kind of shows some of these things, or attempts to show some of these features. Let's see if this plays. Okay, it does end. I think it, okay. attempting to show basic LBBS protections. For this, I have two kernel modules. The first one here is very simple, and all it does is define, fill, and expose a read only after a net buffer. The second module here tries to mimic an attacker who has gained entry into kernel. In this test, I initially read and record the value of byte zero of earlier created read only after a init buffer. Then I spawn a thread that will change the permission of this read only after a init buffer and write into the buffer. This is possibly a very simplistic view of a kernel attack. Finally, before exiting the test, I wait for the kernel thread to finish running, and then I check the task exit code to determine whether the test passed or failed. If the thread ran to completion without any errors, the test actually failed because the attacker managed to write to a read-only buffer. On the other hand, if the write did not go through, the test passed because the attack was thwarted. First to show status quo, I run these tests in a system without LVBS. Here, no support for Hecky in the active hypervisor. Means I have turned off LVBS and hypervisor enforced kernel integrity layer does not have a hypervisor attached. <laughs> 
To begin the test, I first insert the LVBS underscore test underscore mod, the module that exposes the read only buffer. It loads and there is no error. A quick look at Demesk shows that the module should have been signed, but kernel is not in an enforcing mode, and so it lets it load anyways. I now insert the second test module, the module that mimics the attacker. Again, this is a very simplistic view of a kernel attacker, where they have kernel access and they have gotten hold of this read-only buffer, and they can change its permissions. Looking at D message again, we can see that the module init ran successfully, and the thread that actually tampered with the read-only buffer also ran to completion. And hence the test itself failed, because the attacker managed to write to the read-only buffer and change the value of first byte from 0xab to 0x87. Now I run the same tests in a kernel with LVBS enabled and with secure kernel loaded in VTL1 that can enforce the memory protections. Quick look at guest kernel or VTL0 kernel D message shows that HECI is fully enabled and all these various protections are applied. And what you see here on the side is the console log from VTL1 secure kernel. As the initial step, I again load the first test module that establishes the read only after init buffer. And this failed. An inspection of the VTL0 DMS Sage and VTL1 serial console shows that as we saw previously, the module is not signed. And even through VTL0 kernel wanted to load the module, VTL1 secure kernel refused to, and hence the module could not be loaded. Here I quickly sign this module. And now I am able to load this module and establish the read-only buffer. What I show is signature verification, even though it's not enforced in guest kernel, gets enforced by VTL1 kernel. VTL1 kernel will refuse to load the module if the module contents have been tampered with, though, that is harder to demo. Now I load the already signed second module that mimics a kernel level attacker trying to modify a read only after a init buffer. Looking at the D message, we see that the kernel thread attempting to tamper with the read only after a init buffer got killed and the test itself passed, which means that the read only buffer could not be written to. Also looking at the VEL1 console, we see that a memory access violation intercept was raised, and as part of handling this intercept, we raised the general purpose fault in guest kernel. This brings us to the end of the demo. And now to some of the lessons that we learned through this process. One, the first one is that text patching itself or dynamic code injection is quite, the features are quite nuanced. Like I said, we have module loading working and we are working on some of the other text patching features, but they are quite nuanced and they do add non-trivial amount of uh, complexity towards basic kernel integrity that we want to enable with LVBS. Second is that just the fact that we sat down and listed all the text patching features was and looking at them were mind, was mind boggling. It's not like I, we have seen, looked at and used all these features at one point or the other. None, none of them are new. And I'm not saying that none of them are useful. They are all useful for various different reasons, right? And some of them are security critical, like light patching and things like that. But the idea that Linux kernel supports so many text patching features is really thought, it's something thought provoking. And we probably do need to at least question more features that get added, which dynamically injects code into the kernel. And finally, that VTL0 and VTL1 kernel, having it, first of all, have, the VTL1 kernel being a minimal Linux kernel helped a lot because we can reuse a lot of the functionality to verify and establish authentication for a lot of these text patching features. And having it built from the same source also allows for a lot of co code reuse.
so what is next for us? We do want to enable all these other text patching features that we talked about. Um, and I do have the code uploaded into GitHub, everything that we have done so far with 6.6 .6 kernel. Uh, and we are planning to send out the first set of patches uh, to mailing list for review and comments and things like that. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. In the guest kernel, uh, that those are the permissions that are passed from the guest kernel to the secure OS. Right, and so the hypo is applying the permission overlay to the APTs. The hypervisor establishes these permissions in APTs, and when an access happens, hypervisor makes sure that it checks both the the first level page table and the APT. Right, so the hardware checks the first level page table. And right, the right. But if you don't monitor the first level page structure in the guest, you could have an alias that can change the permissions. Or like think of like two two pages, let's say both are execute kernel, right? Mm -hmm. And they're mapped from guest virtual address one and guest virtual address two. I can swizzle again, assuming the guest attacker that has right, they can swizzle the guest virtual addresses across these two pages. And from the APT's permission perspective, they are both fine because they were both marked as execute supervisor. Okay. And they will still go through and it will effectively be like a lock. Yes, so this is this doesn't provide page table protection. So that is edge slot. Uh, that is we that is yet to be implemented in this solution. Yes, that is something that we can extend this to. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>